Welcome to Sunday Night Live. I am Bev Herring, and this is my handsome husband, Harold. And that's my fine wife. Hallelujah. If you're hearing our voices tonight or in some time later, chances are you've been the brunt of someone's negative observations or rants in times past. Now, perhaps, maybe you've even been a little negative from time to time. But if you have been, don't worry. Your secret is safe with us. Besides, you've probably already repented for being a nattering nabob of negativism. Wow. I like that phrase. Um, From a very long time ago. Long time ago. But what can we do about it? Well, we've been shown, and we're going to share with you tonight, seven habits or behavior patterns that should not be a part of your life. Now, you say, Brother Harold, that, that seems kind of negative. No, if you eliminate the negative, you're accentuating the positive. There you go. And that's what we're going to do. All right. We're going to deal with the negative so that we can accentuate the positive and just have a better attitude and outlook as to where you want to go and, and maximize your productivity and your potential for the kingdom of God. I like it. Number one. Number one. Stop rationalizing temper tantrums. Mm. <laughs> um, have you ever heard someone justify they're pitching a fit um, because they, well, I, see, I think that sounds more truthful than temper tantrum. But sometimes they justify it by saying, I always had a temper. I got it from my dad. Or my mom. Or, or my, my mom. It's just the way I am. Throwing a tantrum, temper tantrum is what you do because you're unwilling to change your behavior and take control mm. of your emotions. Now, some folks blame their genes, their DNA, claiming the temper tantrum is hereditary. Now, that excuse might have worked when you were two or three or four years old, but not as an adult. Because we can change as we an adult. We can change. Proverbs 14, verse 17 says, He that is soon angry dealeth foolishly, and a man of wicked devices is hated. A lack of discipline may have contributed to your temper tantrums as a child, but as you grow older, you choose, each of us, we choose how we act and react to every situation. That's right. We can continue temper tantrums, or we can be what Proverbs 14, 7 <clears throat> And the classic Amplified says, we he, can be. He who, he who foams up quickly and flies into a passion deals foolishly. You notice how foolishly just keeps popping up in these That's scriptures? It. That's it. Anyway. Generally, when somebody it says foams up quickly, generally when someone foams at the mouth, they've lost it. And that's something God would never have us to do. No. When a person, whether a person controls their temper, let me say this first. If you lose your temper, mm. you're not in control. That's right. And it's obvious God's not in control. Because if he was, you wouldn't be having a temper tantrum That's right. or losing. So if God's yeah. not in control, then you're not in control. Mm. Then who's in control? Good question. The enemy of your destiny. That's right. He's the one that's trying to get you to change how you act and react. Mm. Uh, but whether or not a person controls their temper is really a choice. It's always a choice. It's a choice. Proverbs 16, verse 32 in the New Living Translation says, better to be patient than powerful, better to have self-control than conquer, to conquer a city. Here's the bottom line. And it's found in James 1.20 in the classic Amplified Bible. That's it. For a <clears throat> man's anger does not promote the righteousness God wishes and requires. That kind of says it all. Yes, it does. Temper tantrums are one negative that you need to eliminate from your life if you ever want to be known as someone who accentuates the positive. That's right. Number two. I love this one. <laughs> it's entitled male pattern baldness. <laughs> and I'm not referring to a lack of hair by myself or anybody else, but rather a head that is lacking in wisdom and empathy. Use your head. Yeah, that's it. Have you ever heard, uh, you know, supervisor or some other people mm -hmm. criticize or lay waste to a coworker or a friend simply saying, I was 
Well, I was just being bold with them. No, you weren't. Because there's a difference between being bold and being rude. And, and you know, we used to work with someone who would say that. Well, I was just being bold. I'm going, no, you were rude. You know, you were rude to that person. Mm. Uh, but sometimes people just don't make the distinction. Some people say what they're thinking. Without thinking. Without considering the consequences <laughs> of the words coming out of their mouth. And once those words come out of your mouth, you can't reach out there and grab them and take them back inside. That's right. It doesn't work that way. You know, we've always told our children to think before they speak. Hopefully they've learned and, and, and that. And see, just because something pops in your head, right. that means uh, that mean it ought to pop out of your mouth. It doesn't. That's right. Yeah, it just doesn't. I know we frequently quote Ephesians 4.29. True. In the class that amplified, and there's a reason for it. This scripture is without a doubt, it, it contains life-changing, bondage-breaking, yoke-destroying, mountain-moving, destiny-shaping, power words. Amen. That's what's in this verse. And, right. and I'm convinced we can never hear it too often. Let me just add in before I say this one. You know, just because you've heard a scripture doesn't mean you know all about it. Sometimes you go, oh, well, I've heard that. You know, or you say, somebody says, That's help good. me with this. And, and you give them a scripture and they go, well, I know that one. No, if you really know something, you know, there's always level. You know, if you know something, there's always another level you can reach. And sometimes when you just, actually, I just had that happen the other day. Very familiar scripture. And I'm thinking, wait a minute. I saw it in a new light. So listen to this and let it sink deep. And if you need to, like, he, like Harold said, we need to kind of meditate on it until it gets down in us. Ephesians 4.29, love the classic Amplified Bible. Let no foul or polluting language, nor evil word, nor unwholesome or worthless talk ever come out of your mouth, but only such speech as is good and beneficial to the spiritual progress of others, as is fitting to the need and the occasion that it may be a blessing and give grace, God's favor, to those who hear it. And another thing I might add at the end of that scripture is that if, if something unwholesome or worthless has come out of our mouth in the last maybe day or two, maybe we haven't quite gotten it down the way we need to because we should be always looking for a way to soothe something over, make it beneficial, make it something that someone could carry in a way and actually work with and not and there are times when we want to speak things and we go, that's the truth, but sometimes it shouldn't be said. You know, we should be speaking the things that are, not the problem, but speaking the solution. You, this is a scripture. You need in the car. I knew it. <laughs> I need in the car. When pulls out in front of you and hits break. Or when I let somebody cross mm. the street in mm. front of me and they don't throw up their hand and say thank you. And I'm giving them a lecture about manners. You know, it's estimated that the average woman speaks 20,000 words a day. Mm. The average man speaks about 7,000. I don't is that know. What we read? I don't know That's the what stats. Regardless of how many it is, the question is of the words you speak, mm. how many of them fall into that category? So, what you're really saying is men have two thirds. Uh, less to account for than a woman. <laughs> okay, well, that's an interesting thought. And should we all be watching our mouths? Hmm, okay. That's what I'm saying. Maybe women just have more to say well, about good things. Okay, moving um, on along. Okay, 1 Corinthians 13, we're going to, you know, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4 and 5. This is in the classic Amplify Bible. Love endures long and is patient and kind. Love never is envious nor boils over with jealousy nor is boastful or vainglorious. Does not display itself haughtily. It is not conceited, arrogant, inflated with pride. It is not rude, unmannerly, and does not act unbecomingly. Love, God's love in us, does not insist on its own rights or its own way. For it is not self-seeking, it is not touchy or fretful or resentful. It takes no account of the evil done to it. It pays no attention to a suffered wrong. 
And boy, you could preach a whole sermon on this because really this whole scripture in 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4 and 5 is saying your flesh is being killed. Because when somebody, when you want to be unkind and you and envy boils over, or jealousy comes up, or if you want to be vo boastful, or you, you know, display yourself haughtily, or you're conceited or prideful, or, you know, and you're not overlooking things that people do, then you're taking stuff personally. And really, we are to represent Christ and let him, you know, I, I, I just in studying the Old Testament, and I love to study in the Old Testament, Moses, it says, was the meekest man on earth. And he was meek because he never, really, he got to the point where he never looked at things as being toward him. He knew he was a spokesman for God. And if you read through those scriptures, you'll find that he never questions God. But when somebody comes up to him and goes, hey, you should be letting us do this, and he knows they're speaking against God, there's many a time when he fell on his face and started interceding for them to keep God from striking them dead. And he was, and they were speaking, quote, assumingly against him, but they weren't. They were speaking against the God in him. And when speak, people come up to us and, and rail at us or carry on about us, the point of it is, is are they really after us or are they hopefully after the Lord in us? that is so strong and powerful that they're convicted and that they, you know, want to, they want to lash out because of the God that's in us. And that's, you know, I mean, it says even, said Jesus learned, learned, you know, the, but through obedience. So I think that that's really, when you go through this and if you're acting all of these ways, then Perhaps it has more to do, we were talking about that earlier today, remember, with the flesh than it is, you know, um, a suffered wrong, so to speak. True. More of a problem with our flesh. And our flesh is always needing to be put under to get me wrong, but I myself included for sure. Yeah. But sometimes, yeah, we, we all have to are question that way, ourselves. Baby. All we right. All that way. Number anyway, three. Number three. Reaction reflexes create relational ruts. You are so clever with your little <laughs> alliterations here. There's a medical condition <clears throat> called acid reflux, which can be quite annoying to deal with. And with this ailment, it can be one of the ways you attack it is with diet. You have to mm. alter your diet a bit in order to do it. Yeah. And, but yet, <laughs> there are many people who suffer from reaction reflex, um, which is not a medical, but a mental and spiritual condition, right. which causes people to react the same way in every situation. This negative behavior happens way too frequently in marriages and, and those relationships. See, because of past patterns, mm -hmm. husbands and wives assume they know how their spouse will react in any given situation, so that they react to the perceived behavior the same way they do in every situation, right. every condition. Uh, and that's not what we it's, should do. It's a stronghold in a bondage. It is. <clears throat> because if you're, if they can push that button, it's kind of what it seems to be. Over time, and not necessarily <laughs> a long period of time, couples can fall into a re re relational rut instead of developing a fresh perspective, which will give their other spouse the benefit of the doubt but they just assume that their thought process is a certain way. And, and in, in addition to that, if you want that spouse to change, then may, the first thing, I think the first thing I learned in marriage, oh, that was a tough one, was that if I wanted, if I want somebody, if I want my husband to change, I want to have to change first. And that's the way change happens. And anybody who's been married can attest to that if you're a Christian, because when you say, God, get them, you know, then the first thing God says to you is, no, I got to get you first. And that's really numero uno, first six months of marriage kind of thing if you're a Christian. So, you know, we're and, all past and that, you know, honey, assumingly. These reactions sometimes mm. are based on trigger words or phrases right. that people say. Right. For instance, it's never your fault. If you hadn't spent all that money, 
She's just a friend that I can talk to. You never listen to me. I can't do anything to please you. Mm -hmm. And the list could go on and on and on. Um, one of the ways, words. I'm sorry. Trigger words. One of the ways to eliminate trigger words, trigger phrases, and reaction reflexes is to purpose in your heart to forget past mistakes and ask God to help you look yes. at every situation and conversation with fresh eyes and a fresh heart. Amen. And, and see, that allows you to change. Something you said, um, you've said in the past, about how if you know, people complain about the husband or the wife and you say, just remember what it was that attracted you right. to that person in the first place. Right. And zero in on the positives and just try to minimize the negatives. But the big thing you said in what, you know, in, in this explanation is when you said, look to God, ask God. He is the only, he has got to be the third person in the equation of a husband and wife or else it, that marriage isn't going to work. I mean, that is really the bottom line. If you don't go to the Lord, <clears throat> you're not making progress because I don't care how bad the situation is. We've seen incredible things turn around or people, and this is the one that hurts me the most, is people who have given up on each other, divorced, and then I hear the man or I hear the woman say, well, you know, I wish I hadn't done that. It's too late then. You know, it's moved on, all that's gone. Work it out. Pray it out. Pray it out together. Pray it out separately, but do what's necessary to make it work because if the grass looks greener on the other side, you are not watering your own lawn. All right. Or it's over a septic tank. Yeah. James 5, verse 16. <laughs> Classic Amplified Bible. I mean, that's an old saying. I've heard it before, but still, it's a book very title, true. Actually. Oh, is it? Yep. Cool. You know, Barbara Johnson your... wrote a book. Grass is always greener over the septic tank. Oh no, I'm talking about watering your own lawn. Oh, okay. I think I've heard that somewhere. Confess to one another. Therefore, your faults, your slips, your fault steps, your offenses, your sins, and pray also for one another that ye may be healed and restored to a spiritual tone of mind and heart. The earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic in its working. Hallelujah. I wouldn't say that what you have to do is confess all your faults to your spouse necessarily if you're really not getting along. That might just break it all off. But I would say, you know, in terms of like, I just looked at her or I looked at him with just, you know, I'm not sure that would help you out. But you can f confess him to God for sure. And your slips, your offenses, your, you know, and then when your spouse gets ready, maybe. But like I always think of what that bad dream that, Bob, you know, Bob I just Harrington came to my mind. Has. Our friend Bob so Harrington, cute. He is a known as sweetie. the chaplain of Bourbon Street. And, um, uh, he coined the phrase, it's fun being safe. Yes, back when it, people didn't think it was fun he, being knowing safe. Knowing getting to know him oh, was a great, great joy, joy in our lives. lives. And his, uh, his wife, who passed away yeah. early. Too early. Yeah, it his was amazing. Wife. But, but he said one time. Uh, that, this was not this, with Becky. This not was with Becky, but else. with his first wife. Yeah. He said he woke up one night having a horrible dream. Yeah. Horrible. And he said, X-rated. He said he slid right out of the bed, started repenting knees, and praying yeah. and asking God to forgive him. He said he was praying so loud he woke his wife up. She said, what's wrong, Bob? He said, I had a bad dream and I'm praying and asking God to forgive me. She said, well, tell me about it and I'll pray with you. He said, no, no. If I pray to God, he'll forgive and forget. If I pray to you, know, tell tell you, you and you pray with me, you may forgive, but you won't ever forget. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. So, <clears throat> God forgives and, and forgets. forgets. That's right. I mean, I'm just saying don't stir up stuff. I think that's not. We need to be encouraged that we can overcome, right? Every, Every negative, negative thought, thought. Emotion. That's right. And reaction to the words. And here's Isaiah 43, verse 18 and 19 in the classic Amplified Bible. Help us to move on. You know, sometimes just claiming this word and say, Lord, I want to do this. I want this to be real in my life right now. Do, do not earnestly remember the former things, neither consider the things of old. 
Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive and know it, and will you not give heed to it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. If you're having a rough time, say, Lord, I don't want to remember all these negative things from my past and the things that went on. I, want to, I don't even want to consider the things of old. I want you to make them new because you are renewing me day by day, moving me from glory to glory, and I want to see the progress, and I want to work with you in it. Anyway, and let him do it. Hallelujah. If you remember past sin, yeah. even though it may have been pleasurable at the time, mm -hmm. but recalling past sin will create a situation where you have to deal with future sin. Well, that's a fact. Let it loose it and let it go. That's it. Number four, never assume anything. Mm -hmm. Never assume anything. Now, I don't really, really remember the first time I ever heard someone uh, take the word assume and hyphenate it and, and, and talk about what a person ought to be. Uh, I've always remembered that bit of human interpretation because it does sometimes make me hesitate to use the word assume. Yeah. Words are powerful. They are. Sometimes words mean different things to different, to different people. people. <laughs> you know, I remember reading some time back about an elementary school in Texas, school teacher, elementary school teacher in Texas, who was re reviewing her weekly vocabulary words. I remember the vocabulary words we had to learn every week. When she asked her students, what does the word pause mean? The little girl immediately popped her hand up and said, I know, teacher, I know. And with obvious delight, the little girl said that pause is the button on the cable TV remote which allows you to stop the TV show or DVD to answer the phone or go eat dinner. That was her definition of pause uh, because it's one brought about by popular culture. That's right. uh, and that's probably not the answer the teacher was hoping for. But I think it definitely reflected the little girl's experience and the effect of popular culture on our children. That's right. As we talk with people, we will assume or perhaps judge what we think the other person is saying, or, th or more yeah. correctly, based on their past ex our past experience with that person and in life. And that's a bad mistake. We can't always figure that we know what somebody else is really saying or thinking. Isaiah 11 verse 3 in the classic Amplify Bible says, And shall make him of quick understanding, and his delight shall be in the reverential and obedient fear of the Lord and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes neither decide by the hearing of his ears sometimes we just have to have that spiritual dimension in the Lord helping us to not judge other people in order to eliminate negative thoughts about other people yeah. we need to open be open and clearly communicate to determine exactly what the person thinks Right. what you think, and, and so that you can make sure that you're on the same sheet of music, um, so to speak. Good point. One of our favorite scriptures. We have so many favorite scriptures. I know. We've been... But one of them is James 119, the classic Amplified, mm. which could be quoted in several areas that we've already discussed, but we can do it on this point. There you go. James 119 says, Understand this, my beloved brethren, let every man be quick to hear, a ready listener, slow to speak, slow to take offense, and to get angry. Actually, this would be a good verse to personalize. And uh, understand this, my beloved brethren. Let a herald be quick to hear, a ready listener, slow to speak, slow to take offense, and to get angry. Amen. So I personalize it using me. Normally I use other people, but... The point, too, is that we can choose to not be offended. We can say, Lord, you know, you take care of this. I just, you know, and that's so much better on everybody, really, when you just turn it over to the Lord and eliminate it out of your life and, you know, I'd say, leave it alone. Number five. Number five. Stop kicking the cat. Yeah. Stop kicking the cat. You're, on, you're the only one. The only one. The only one who can determine the kind of day you're going to have. That's right. You need to understand this. You determine 
what kind of day you're going to have because you're the one that will either make it a positive or a negative experience. Only you can choose to allow other people right. to affect your day. That's right. That's a choice that you make whether or not they do. So you'll decide whether you'll be kicking the cat or not. I love this story. Mm. Samuel wakes up late one morning, grabs a cup of coffee, gets in the car and starts out. Somebody pulls in front of him, he slams on brakes and spills the coffee all over his white shirt. Mm -hmm. um, fearing that he'll be late to work, he starts driving 80 miles an hour in a 65 mile an hour speed zone and is pulled over by a policeman who gives him a ticket. Samuel is really mad when he gets to work. When Sarah, the receptionist, wishes him a good morning, he replied with a scowl, what's good about it? <laughs> and just about that time as he walked away, Hank, the Xerox repairman, walked in. And, and Sarah let him have it. She said, you know, if you'd have fixed that thing right the first time, you wouldn't be coming back here today. This time, try to get it right so we don't have the Right down back. and work and just keep calling you, giving him a hard time. And then when Samuel walked in the office, his assistant, he asked his assistant about a report that was due. And Alice, the assistant, so she didn't have a good answer because one of the people under his, you know, management, management team. team had not turned it in on time. So Alice calls Jack, the manager, on that team. He reads him the riot act, tell him, that, tell him to get it in up ultimately, you know, quickly. But Jack is angry, but complies, does what she said. Then Jack chews out Shaniqua because she forgot to remind him that the report was due. So, and see, Jack's still mad when he gets home after work. And he walks in and his wife, Nancy, asks him how his day went and about that time, Fluffy the cat walked in front of him and he kicked Fluffy and said, get out of my way. All you've done today is lay around and do nothing. And see, it would have been much better off if Samuel had left his house when he spilled the coffee, driven over to Jack's house and kicked Jack's cat because a lot of other folks would have had a good day that day. That's right. Because <laughs> Samuel was not having a good day and he just kind of shared it every, with everybody else That's it. because um, he passed it to Sarah to Hank to Alice to Jack to Shaniqua to and Nancy and finally to Fluffy the cat everybody got to have a bad everybody day everybody got except you can purpose in your heart to not kick the cat that's it and you're going to have a better day Stop so the real the point of this story is that's you're right. in control that's right and and see if you're having not the best day then don't make someone else have a, a bad day simply because mm -hmm. you're not. That's right. And you know. In fact, you'll find out. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. You'll find out that if you do just the opposite, if you start encouraging people and blessing them, that your whole day will turn around and change. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you something. <clears throat> I used to teach this, you know, back in the day. But there's two people, two people with a lot of um, clout in your life. And sometimes you have to catch these things. You talk about buttons. We were talking about buttons. Two people can make you have a bad day, your spouse and your mother, or maybe your father. You know, somebody says something negative, and it just sets you off. You need to, you need to catch yourself and go, OK, I'm not going to let this bad feeling affect my entire day. I mean, you need to make a note of it, because the truth of the matter is there's, there's some, I used to tell, teach women and I used to say the way you send your husband out the door in the morning or you know if you have you know if you're sending him off or before you go what you say to your husband and your children will affect everything that happens that day so think about it think about it before you decide that this is the that you're not happy and you're gonna spread it around a little bit you know you drop the carton of eggs or whatever making breakfast point of it is is how you send them out is the kind of day that you're determining for them unless they know, you know, what we know now. But I'm just saying that. It was, anyway, it was interesting. And the good news is I've been the beneficiary of that advice. Oh, well, good. Thank you, darling. I like it. 
Matthew 7, verses 3 through 5. This is in the Message Bible. <clears throat> this is a great eliminate, elimination of, you know, behavior, established behavior. Of negatives and establish exactly. good behavior. And to establish good, behavior. that's right. Anyway, it says, don't pick on people. Jump on their failures. Criticize their faults. Unless, of course, you want the same treatment. That critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. It's easy to see a smudge on your neighbor's face and be oblivious to the ugly sneer on your own. Do you have the nerve to say, let me wash your face for you, when your own face is distorted by contempt? It's this whole traveling roadshow mentality all over again, playing a holier-than-thou part instead of just living your part. Wipe that ugly sneer off your face, and you might be fit to offer a washcloth to your neighbor. I like that <laughs> translation. Yeah, that the message kind of gets down where the rubber meets the Don't road. Don't pick on people. Jump on their failures. Criticize their faults. Yeah. Unless you want the same treatment, because that's exactly what <clears throat> you're going to get. Sometimes when what you're you sow, you reap. Yeah, when you're unhappy with yourself, you can really, it just stirs up the negative to want to jump on somebody else. But face the music, face the mirror. Get rid of what's in your own life, and you'll live a happier life. Face the music, face the mirror. That's good. Anyway. I'm a New York Yankee baseball fan. Now, I've been all my life, and I quote. moment of silence they lost today. Um, but Yogi Berra, who was a catcher and later manager, an amazing, yeah. funny man. One, I think one of the great catchers of all time. Yogi Berra said one time, I never blame myself when I'm not hitting. I just blame the bat. <laughs> and if it keeps up, I change bats. There you go. After all, <clears throat> if I know it isn't my fault that I'm not hitting, how can I get mad at myself? <laughs> That's really funny. And I've seen people change bats. Yeah, I you have know, too. I mean, ball players, which is kind of cute. But. Number six. Number six. We'll move right along. Mani mani manipulation. Mm. Manipulation mm. is more than a game. Yeah. It's a sin. There you go. Many people incorrectly assume, and there's that word again, uh -oh. assume. That the Bible says manipulation is a sin as witchcraft. Well, those words are not in the Bible. They're not. The truth of the saying is found in Matthew 5, 33 through 37. And we're going to use the Message Bible. Again in the Message Bible. Because there's a little more clarity. Yeah. Gets it down where you can understand it. And don't say anything you don't mean. The council, this council is embedded deep in our traditions. You only make things worse when you lay down a smokescreen of pious talk saying, I'll pray for you, and never doing it. Saying, God be with you, and not meaning it. You don't make your words true by embellishing them with religious lace. In making your speech more religious, it becomes less true. Just say yes and no. When you manipulate words to get your own way, you go wrong. How do you know if you've been manipulated? Mm. Three questions. First, when you're with this friend or personal acquaintance, do you always end up doing what they want to do? Especially when you don't want to do it. Especially when you don't want to do it. Second, does the other person disregard or make light of what you want to do? Third, when you disagree, does the other person always seem to win? If you answered yes to these three questions, then you need to ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to you whether or not you're being manipulated. The best advice we can give on manipulation mm. is found in Matthew 24:4. In the English Standard Version. And Jesus answered them, See that no one leads you astray. To stop being manipulated, you need to stop making wrong choices based on information from truthfully bad associations. Eliminating the negativity of manipulation mm -hmm. is, again, our choice. You know, friends, you can kind of eliminate friends, or you can stay away from coworkers, or you can kind of, you know, do the best you can. Sometimes it's just prayer. Prayer, if you're married to somebody who tends to be a bit manipulated, if, whether you, you, they know it or not. Sometimes people do it, and they don't even know they're doing it. But that's the way they've seen things done, and that's the way they adopted. 
this way. It takes prayer, it really does. It takes prayer to, to be able to understand and let the Lord deal with things as only He can do. And sometimes it's truly just giving it into their hands, no matter what the, you know, this could be coworkers and things that you get kind of stuck in this situation. But 1 Corinthians 15, verses 33 through 35, this is in the classic Amplified Bible, says, Do not be so deceived and misled. Evil com companionships, communion and associations corrupt and depraved good manners and morals and character. Awake from your drunken stupor and return to sober sense in your right minds and sin no more. For some of you have not the knowledge of God, you are utterly and willfully and disgracefully ignorant and continue to be so, lacking the sense of God's presence and all the true knowledge of Him. I say this to your shame. Wow. Strong, strong scripture. Yeah. Dr. Joyce Brothers once said, love comes from, love comes when manipulation stops. Yes. When you think more about the other person than about his or her reactions to you. When you dare to reveal yourself fully, when you dare to be vulnerable. Yeah, that's a, that's a subject we could really preach on, a series on almost manipulation because it does exist and it's sad and but true. Seventh way to eliminate the negative and accentuate the positive is to avoid commiserators. Oh Lord, yes. Commiserators. Lee Iacocca, the man who, I guess. Uh, created the Mustang for Ford, mm -hmm. and then later turned around the Chrysler Corporation. He once said, I love this, boys, there ain't no free lunches in this country. And don't spending your whole life commiserating that you got raw deals. You got to say, I think if I keep working at this and want it bad enough, I can have it. It's called perseverance. Yeah, amen. And I want to throw something in there too. And this was this is actually a quote from Rich Dad, Rich Dad Poor Dad. He said, you know, what most people the way that they raise their children, and they that when the children come to them and say, you know, I want this, I want this. He said most of the parents, you know, will say, well, we can't afford it. We can't afford it. He said that what you need to say to your child is, okay, let's sit down and figure out how you can afford it, which is a That's perfect answer in terms of like, because what happens is people have a poor mentality, a poor thinking financial mentality, because their whole lives they kept thinking, can't afford it, can't afford it. No, you sit down and decide, how many lawns do I have to cut? How many cars do I have to wash? You know, is this, and if you want it and you persevere enough, or if you get in there and you work hard, then you can have what it is that you want but you have to have the right attitude and get to the bottom of it and eliminate the negative. And that's why it's important who you hang around with. Oh yeah. And uh, if, you're, if you spend time talking with negative folks about negative events, no surprise, it's only reasonable that you're gonna find yourself becoming more and more negative right. and more and more critical. The dominant thoughts in our life yes. will draw similar thoughts to us, similar people to us, like a strong magnet. Amen. In other words, if you're a positive person, you're going to draw positive people, people to you. People who want to be positive that's are going it. to be attracted to you. And that's why if you lose your job or get laid off, yeah. don't go hang around with other folks that you used to work with that got laid off or you know, released. And for sure, don't sit there commiserating, complaining about the company. That's right. Yeah. Just thank God you had a job there for a while and be excited about the next job God's got for you. Take all the negative energy that, you know, on all the, instead of worrying about all the problems and stuff, and put it toward finding the solution to the problem. And if you're in a situation where you're going through a divorce or separation, yes. stop claiming, stop complaining about your ex, yes. and get ready for your next. There you go. And if you're complaining about the ex, you're not preparing yourself for you next. Or hanging around people who are also divorced who want to just commiserate and say how bad everything always was. Mm. You don't want to hang around people who talk about other people and share their weaknesses and That's criticize right. them. That's right. Because that critical spirit is contagious. Yes, it is. You don't want to do that. And if we, when it goes back to how you've been hurt or what you've gone through, mm -hmm. if we dwell on past hurts, failures, 
broker relationships, financial mistakes, that's right. then we're doomed to repeat them. That's right. It's going to happen that's again. That's all we're thinking about. Isaiah 43, verse 18 in the Message Bible says, Forget about what's happened. Don't keep going over old history. If you messed up, you fess up, and you get up, and you move on, right? If, if you've messed up, if you've been negative, I encourage you to use what? Alcoholic nomus. Alcohol. Alcoholics Anonymous. Alcoholics Anonymous. What they call their HALT, H-E-L-T system. It says a person is most vulnerable becoming upset when mm. they are. This is so true. This is so true. Now listen to this. And this is for every area of life. It doesn't have to be alcohol. Hun when they're hungry, when they're angry, when they're lonely, and when they're tired. You don't make decisions. You don't ponder on important things when you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. That's right. H-A-L-T. H-A-L-T. Hold it. Don't do it. A uh, person with a problem with alcohol are more likely to drink yep. during those four times. People person who likely. overeats are yep, more, more likely. likely to overeat during those, those times. times. People who are in a difficult marriage yep. more likely to have an affair or an alienation of affection. Right when these vulnerabilities occur. Yeah. That's why it's important that you have a prayer partner, which should be your spouse if you're married, mm -hmm. because that's the one who will help you overcome adversity by clinging to the Word of God and seeking godly counsel. If you can't pray with your spouse to begin with, if you're a woman, find one of the older women in church. That's right. You know, a or, seasoned Christian. Or the pastor's wife. Right. Or, you know, and... Um, like, do, yeah. Uh, I, I do recommend that Same if you're gender. counseled by the pastor and you're going through this, that never be counseled by him with his door open and his door closed. Yes, or and best to have somebody in there with you. It's best to have somebody in the room with him Amen. when that happens. Mm. Commiserate, commiserate, commiserating, commiserating is misery. Is misery, not prayer. Because commiserating is not giving things over to God. That's right. We don't need to commiserate about what happened. Instead, we need to pray and plan for what's going to happen Yes. based on the Word of God. Amen. Based on the Word of God. When you think about it, seriously, when you think about it, what happens when you, even, even to just idle talk, so to speak, somebody comes in, you start talking about it, they say, wow, you're not going to believe this, but I was just down at the stop sign and this guy almost hit me. And then somebody else joins in and says, hey, the other day, this happened. And you just start getting more and more about, oh, well, this happened. You know what I'm saying? And it, and it starts going down. And everybody starts coming up with all of their negative things that happen. Instead of just, sometimes you have to just recognize that's where it's going and cut it off and go, hey, let's talk about something that's more upbeat and more positive And we'll pray over this. Thank God you didn't get in a wreck and keep on going, you know. So... You have to catch those things or else you find yourself working in the negative. If you're going through negativity, if you're experiencing mm. and dealing with any of these seven things, you let the Lord bring the change. Yes. Your, your environment will not change until you change. That's true. People you're having challenges with. Your spouse won't change until you until change. Until you change. And, and it's, that's just the way it is. It is the way it and is. And if you go to God expecting you to change, yeah. then your environment will change. Those people around you will change. And let me tell you, the best thing that can happen to you, are you listening? Really, this is, I'm telling you, however many years I've been alive, experience. If you change, it'll always be for the better. I mean, you are going to become a better person. If nobody else becomes a better person, you become a better person. You start handling things better. Your relationship with God gets stronger and things start. So change is actually a very good thing. Amen. It is. You know, mm. Hallelujah. what do you is expect good. God to do yes. in dealing with these seven situations? Yes. What is your level of expectation? This morning on Rich Sauce for Breakfast. I was thinking of that. You quoted a scripture. Yeah, it was, you quoted the one that I love, that the Lord spoke yeah. to me about. Psalm 147, uh, 11. Psalm 147, 11. In the Living Bible. In the Living Bible, which is different. Because instead of the word hope, 
the Lord puts a word expect and it says he who reverences and loves the Lord and expects him to be loving and kind. And you know, it's not just hope, it's expecting God to do something because the word says that he will. You expect him. You expect him. To change. Yes. You. Mm, that's and right. And then everything around you. That's right. You've got to change what's in you. You know, we've talked for years. That's right. The change is a door that can only be opened from, from the, the inside. inside. you got to change what's in here mm -hmm. before you ever change what's out there. Uh, but once you change what's in here, things will start to change. And they'll look better, different. Yes, they will. Hallelujah. If you're doing the positives instead of the negative. Hallelujah. That was good, honey. Thank you. To God be the glory. <laughs> Amen. That's a good teaching. Hallelujah. We make a good team. If I do say so myself. For 45 years, one month, and 19 days. Okay, good. Just checking on just, you. Just saying. <laughs> just saying. Uh, but until, If you've yes, been blessed by the teaching, take your mouse, go to the top, where it says, so we'll see, just ask God, what seed he'll have you put in the ground. Do what he says. So we'll ever ask. ask. And until tomorrow morning, and make sure you join us tomorrow morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. Tomorrow morning, rich sauce for breakfast, 8.30 Eastern. And if you didn't hear it today, you can go yeah, listen to the playback. CarolHearing.com, click the button. It says rich sauce for breakfast, and it'll tell you how to listen to the playback. Because it'll bless you. Hallelujah. Amen. And until then, happy, happy trails. trails. God bless you. Happy trails. And keep thinking rich thoughts. We love you. Bye-bye.